So we come to the second part of Catholic philosophy, and this would be the last part of Catholic philosophy until the end, which is until the Renaissance period and the Scientific Revolution. So the thing to concern about of the later parts of Catholic philosophy is about scholatism. What scholatism is, is that it was re-reasoning. So basically, after Augustine, the church philosophy basically died out. So in the Dark Ages, there wasn't that much theology, and only the authority of the church was pre prevailing. The entire church history was not always of this kind, as seen by St. Augustine and the previous saints and philosophers, but what you'd see is that before scholatism, basically what happened was that it was usually the church making all the decisions through its councils and the pope and whatnot. So what scholatism was was that saints and popes and people in reaction to rebellions and protests that the, school, the church was being totalitarian, they went into a period of re-reasoning, and basically how this re-reasoning worked Worked is that they took the authority of Plato, which was the somewhat accepted accepted expert on logic, metaphysics, and philosophy, and they tried to replace it with Aristotle. Now, this was because Aristotle was the most translated and the most well-known person after it has been translated into Latin. So, even though Plato is still considered the most influential philosopher in Western philosophy today, the people back then thought Aristotle was the most influential because his works were the best known works. So what scholastic philosophers do did was that they tried to reconcile Aristotelian philosophy, which was, again, the accepted philosophy of logic and reason, with theology, in which the most prominent philosopher and theologian was Thomas Aquinas. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas is really... A prominent for many reasons. He's considered one of the most prominent theologians in the period of Catholic Church, and he is considered the most prominent person in scholatism, no matter who you ask. So, he wrote two books, Summa Contra Gentilis and Summa Theology. So, the first book, Gentilis, means non-Jews. The first book was addressing people who are not believers, which was a slight contradiction because almost all books written before Aquinas was addressed at theologians and talking to people who were assumed to have the belief in the Catholic Church. But Aquinas tried to address people by saying that not it's not only because of the Bible and the authority of the church that God should be accepted. There's also reason and Aristotelian logic that this is true too. He also wrote Summa Theology, but this this is a very this is in my opinion it's a better book than Summa Contragentilis and more prominent. But Summa Theology concerns more of the people already assuming to believe in Christ, so we'll focus on Summa Contragentilis. So Aquinas had five proofs in God, which was the first proof was that since every everything needed a mover, as in that. A pencil could not move without a hand directing it, and a hand could not move without the body, and etc., etc. We eventually go to the point when there's a first cause, but the first cause cannot be caused without something that does not have a cause. So everything must have, there must be a mover that is independent of all the causes, which is God. The second argument is that everything has a regression, which progresses the next action, which again is similar to the first one in that they also call for God as the first regressor. The third one is that everything needs a source, which is again following the first one that God must be the source. Now, those three arguments are usually treated as one, and the common argument is that these three is con it's establishing an authority, is establishing an all argument logic, which is rebuked by following the same logic. Now, you, so what this is saying is that because the logic is true, it has to be inherently false. So the common argument is that what Aquinas is doing is that he's not really establishing the proof of God because there's a mover, but what he's doing is simply rebuking the logic that everything must have a first cause. So this cannot be really considered true proof because of following the strict logic rules of contemporary society, but it is an acceptable proof and has been until mm, current contemporary logic. So his fourth argument is that there are many perfect things found in this world, perfect morals, perfect beauty, and whatnot. So what Aquinas says is that these all of these perfections must have a source, which it stems from, because perfection is a quality, and that quality is attributed to God. His fifth argument is that everything every living thing and every un not non-living thing has a purpose, but non-living things cannot have a purpose because they are dead, so what's going on is that 
They must have a purpose outside of themselves, which cannot be living things because they're not the same thing. So it must be something not made out of neither living or non-living things, which must be God. The fifth argument is rarely addressed. It's it's rebuked by contemporary philosophers, and it's it's not really accepted as a really good argument. Nor is the fourth one because the main the the most argument that goes is Augustine's proof. Augustine says that everything has a quality of perfect. Now. I forgot to mention it in the last lecture, but this is one of the most ontological and accepted arguments of God. So what Augustine said was that since everything had some kind of quality of perfectness, this could not be imagined unless there is a kind of perfect belief being that in that gives this quality of perfectness to those inanimate or animate objects, and that must be God. Now Aquinas argues against this by saying that there are sources of perfect, but again, this is not this is not very accepted in contemporary or that society in which Aquinas lived. But, alright, Aquinas lived. So, his Summa Contra Gentilis has four books. The first thing about God, mostly of the proof. And he also says this, that God cannot be known as a quality of perfect because it's impossible to know God. It's only possible to know God, to know what God not is. So, it is only possible to imagine God as far as we can imagine his negative. He also he talks about souls in his second book, saying that souls are eternal beings, but then they are not, but they are born when they're, when we are created. For the third one, he concerns himself with ethical problems, and the fourth one, he talks about theology, which is which is both not really important as it pertains mostly to Catholicism. The criticism about Saint Thomas Aquinas is this: Aquinas's arguments and proofs, like he, like um, later theologians, already have a conclusion in which the proofs are simply meant to establish whatever the conclusion is. Now, people right now might say, what's the problem with that? It's not bad to justify your arguments, but in philosophy, as you might be aware, it's not good to justify arguments if you don't have correct proof of it simply because you feel right and then create arguments designed to support for it. For example, Aquinas says that a marriage between a man and a woman should not be exterminated because a father is better for the children's teachings because he is more rational and because he has physical authority over his mother. Now those two arguments can be easily rebuked by current educators by saying that there's no reason to assume that a man is more rational than a woman and say that physical authority isn't really good for education of the children. But what's going to happen is that Aquinas and his followers, whatever the re reasons and the rebuttals might be, will still follow the conclusions because they feel that it is correct and that's not that it should not be accepted in philosophy. Aquinas should be better reasoned as more of an organizer than a real original thought. Although he had original thought combining Aristotle and philosophy and theology, he should be more of an organizer than a less than an authority in church thoughts. But he is accepted. The other group I like to mention is Franciscans. Franciscans were the group against Thomas Aquinas. They're not that important in philosophy in that they are theologians, but they're more important in saying that they are people who didn't really accept Aquinas and want to rebel against him. The most important person that's well known to us is Oakham. He was a theologian, mathematician, and logician, which is kind of rare in the Middle Ages. But what he's best known for is going to be later influential as Oakham's late razor. He said that there's no point making hypothetical assumptions when it's more than necessary. For example, I could assume that I've been taken over by an alien and my brains are being controlled by an external source, but there is no reason to assume that unless I have proper evidence for it, which is, as Burton Russo puts it, it's a very good thing to, that's a very good hypothetical condition in logic. It's, there, it's very good when you're talking about logics and proofs and conditions as we go on later on to prove what is real and what is not. So at this point, after the Franciscans, it was the end of the Middle Ages. So after the Great Schism, which will which you will learn about in world history, I've no doubt, there's the split between the papacy and the regional leaders, which led to an independence from church thought, which is very good considering that it's philosophy, but it also led to an unruly region when we talk about political science as well. So in the next session, we would end with the two series on theology and the Middle Ages, but then we'll go on to political sciences and the other more philosophical philosophy of the modern philosophy. Thank you.